In the previous lesson, you learned about metals. You learned about their atomic structure and the properties that their atomic structure gives to metals. You learned that the atomic structure of metals is dominated by these free-moving outer electrons. In this lesson, you're going to learn about nonmetals. And we're going to start off by learning about the structure of nonmetals and how that structure is different than the structure of metals. Later on, we're going to learn how that structure gives nonmetals different properties than metals have. So let's get started learning about the atomic structure of nonmetals by once again considering the periodic table of elements and where the nonmetals are located on that periodic table. So here's a picture of most of the periodic table of elements. Here are where the nonmetals are on the periodic table of elements. Most of the nonmetals are way on the right hand side of the periodic table. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the structure of these different elements that you see here. I'm going to pull out one of these elements to begin talking about. This is an iodine atom. And as you look at this iodine atom, you'll notice that it has a lot of electrons. Atoms near the bottom of the periodic table where iodine is located have a lot of electrons. But we're not concerned about all of the electrons in an atom. We're only really concerned about the ones that are available for bonding and interacting with other atoms, and those are the outer electrons. So let's consider iodine as a positively charged core and then its outer electrons. Here with a nonmetal, the core has a huge charge, seven plus, and then there's a whole bunch of outer electrons. In fact, there's almost a full shell of outer electrons. What is a full shell? For most atoms, most atoms follow the octet rule, which says if atoms have eight electrons in their outer shell, it's going to be more stable. So the nonmetals have either a completely full outer shell with eight, or an almost full outer shell. In this case, iodine has seven, which is really close to eight. Now again, this is a picture of a neutral atom. The inner core has a seven plus charge, and then there's seven electrons around the outside to balance that off. Now, how is iodine going to get that extra electron? They can steal electrons from other atoms and become negative ions. Here's what it looks like when an iodine atom gains an electron. Here are all of the electrons of iodine. There are seven that are way up around the outside. And we're going to add one more electron from somewhere to the outside to give it a negative one charge. But instead of just taking an electron from somewhere, there's another way that an iodine atom can gain those eight electrons that it needs around the outside. And that is by sharing electrons with another nearby iodine atom. The iodine atom on the left has seven electrons in its outer shell. So does the iodine atom on the right. What happens if they move really close together and share a pair of electrons? Because they're sharing that pair in the middle, each one has eight electrons in its outer shell. Here's what that looks like at the atomic level. If these two atoms come close by to one another so their orbitals, their outer shells overlap with each other, they can share a pair of electrons in the overlap area and now they are stuck together, they're bonded, and they each basically have eight electrons in their outer level. That's another way that nonmetals are able to interact with each other. They're able to form these bonds where they share electrons. That's called a covalent bond. Most nonmetals are able to form covalent bonds with atoms of the same kind. So an iodine and an iodine bonding together. That's one of the things that's going to give nonmetals the properties that they have. Okay, let's consider another element from the periodic table. And we're going to consider one more concept too. Nonmetals are able to form the three different types of structures that we talked about when we talked about how atoms can be structured with each other. They can either be crystals, they can be molecules, or they can just be individual atoms. And nonmetals are able to form all three of those structures. Let's pull out, for example, one of the noble gases. Let's take a look at neon. Here's a neon atom. Noble gases are the way that they are because they actually already have eight electrons in their outer shell. 
they don't need to bond together with other atoms at all to get eight electrons in their outer shell. And what's that going to cause? Well, these atoms are going to just stay completely separate from one another and not bond together at all. That makes this an atomic element. Let's take a look at another type of atom from the periodic table. In this case, we'll take a look at nitrogen, which is the most common atom in the atmosphere of the Earth. Nitrogen only has five electrons in its outer shell. How is it going to get eight? Well, here's one way that it can do it. Nitrogen can come together with another atom of nitrogen that also has five electrons, and they can share a pair. But a pair isn't enough. They're going to share one pair, and another pair, and a third pair, and make a triple bond with each other. This maybe makes a little more sense if we look at it with the actual atoms. When I bring the two atoms close together, you'll see that their outer shells really overlap and they share three pairs of electrons in that overlap area. Now they each have two outer electrons and they're sharing three pairs. So those two plus those six that are in those, the middle in those three pairs give them each a total of eight in their outer shell. Notice what these form. These form molecular elements. Each nitrogen atom is so tightly bonded to one other nitrogen atom that they're going to stay connected but individually from each other as individual molecules, a molecular element. And then lastly, we'll take a look at an element like phosphorus. Phosphorus has five electrons in its outer shell as well, but it doesn't form triple bonds. The atom is structured in such a way that it can't. But here's what it can do. Phosphorus can come together with another phosphorus atom, and another phosphorus atom, and finally, one more phosphorus atom, and they can each share pairs of electrons with each other so that each of them has eight in its outer shell. Now, it's really hard to picture this, so bear with me. I'm going to show you where the electrons that are being shared are. Here's our first phosphorus atom. I'm going to bring in another one. I'm going to show you where that pair of electrons gets shared in the middle. Then I'm going to bring in another one. This one's going to have two pairs of electrons shared, one with each of the atoms that's already there. And then finally, my fourth atom of phosphorus is going to share one pair with each of the atoms that's already there as well. So it's sharing with three different atoms. Now, each of these atoms is sharing a pair with all three of the other atoms. Where are they in this mess of atoms? Well, here they are. I'm going to highlight the electrons around the first atom. Notice that they're sharing a pair in the center with the atom on the right. Here are the electrons around the bottom atom, and it's sharing its pairs with the one on top, the orange pair with the one on the left, and the pink pair with the one on the right. And then the top atom is sharing pairs of electrons as well with all three other atoms. Now, if you don't see that, just know that these orbitals of these atoms are overlapping one another and they're sharing pairs of electrons with each other. That's what they do. Those electrons in the center that are being shared are really locked in tight. They can't really move around. But this substance, phosphorus, actually forms a solid. And here's how that happens. When you have a phosphorus atom by itself, those electrons around the outside are a little bit freer to kind of move around the outside of the atom. And every once in a while, they're all going to move sort of to the same side giving the atom a temporary positive charge on the bottom and a temporary negative charge on the top. What does that cause to happen? On a nearby phosphorus atom, because there's a positive charge above them, all the electrons are going to be attracted to that positive charge. So its outer electrons are also going to form the same kind of arrangement. And what's going to end up happening is these positive and negative charges on each molecule are going to induce positive and negative charges on other molecules nearby. And because we have this arrangement of positive and negative charges sticking together on the outside of the atoms, it forms a crystal. Now, this is a very weakly bonded crystal. It's dependent on the electrons being pushed to one side of the molecule, even though those electrons aren't going to really stay there very stably for very long. Weakly bonded crystal elements. All right, now you understand a little bit more about the structure of nonmetals. The structure of nonmetals are dominated by electrons being shared between atoms that are strongly bonded in place between 
where the atoms are located.